and program directed at preventing dogs from ending up as strays and keeping them away from dangerous city streets and highways. Anna holds an economics degree from the University of Santo Tomas, Manila, and is pursuing a law degree in the hope that she can improve the judicial mechanisms of her country in favor of the animals. I pass the floor to Anna, who will be speaking about the problem with the outdoor pet mindset in the Philippines. Anna. Hello, my name is Anna Cabrera, and I'm the Executive Director of the Philippine Animal Welfare Society, and I'm here to talk about outdoor pet keeping and the stray animal welfare problem. Stray dogs and stray cats are among the biggest animal welfare concerns in most Asian countries. Many advocates started out with dog and cat issues as these are the animals closest to our hearts. With a lack of massive spay-neuter programs and unregulated pet selling and pet breeding in the Philippines, the problem of strays here has, of course, ballooned to unimaginable proportion. As a springboard to our discussion on strays, let me take you to the classification of dogs and cats into four categories depending on their dependence on humans for survival. First category, uh, these are the strays. Born in the street, they may be offspring of once-owned or abandoned dogs and cats. They survive by hunting and scavenging and generally stay away from people. The second category, abandoned animals or unwanted by owners. They are also called strays. They began as family pet and they were abandoned or they were let loose when the owners thought they could not be bothered to care for these animals anymore. A third category of animals are those that are owned but not controlled. So these are often victims of um, animal catchers of the local government, which may have problems now with either strays or irresponsibly kept pets. So basically, the owned and not cat controlled category are uh, pets of irresponsible pet owners. Uh, the fourth category are owned or controlled animals, and they have um, essentially owners that are responsible for them. Now, the owner or guardian will admit that he's the guardian if ever there is someone who has been hurt or damaged by the animal. If the owner is truly responsible, these owned animals will be spayed or neutered. We have also highlighted the first three categories of companion animals in order to show you that in the Philippines, and I suspect in many Asian countries, a large number of animals belong to these categories and we will refer to them as strays or semi-strays. Now in the pie chart I have based on the number of calls and emails that PAWS gets and many of the cruelty calls that we get or hurt animals, animals in need of immediate medical attention, they are those in the strays and semi-strays category. For this reason it makes sense that we uh, animal welfare advocates have to focus on strays or semi-strays. We have to focus on their origins and deal with them in a way that will affect lawmakers, stakeholders, members of the community, so that our job as animal welfare advocates would be easier. For many years, the Philippines has categorized dogs and cats only into two, the ASCAL or PUSAKAL, or native dogs and cats, and the imported MELAHE or with breed, referring to purebreds, this practice of lackadaisical pet keeping for native animals most probably started in mainly rural or provincial areas where there were no yards or enclosures for animals. And ASCA is literally the contraction of the words ASO, which means dog, and CALLE, which means street. PUSAKAL is the contraction of words PUSA, meaning cat, and Calle meaning street. One of Pause's first steps was to change the said problematic term from Ascal to Aspin and Pusakal to Puspin, which is um, a contraction of Asong Pinoy or Pusang Pinoy. Pinoy is the slang term for Filipino. They disturb homes and so they are native dog and they are Filipino dog. Um, essentially, there was a general prevalence of irresponsible pet ownership with pets 
either allowed to run free and fend for themselves or dogs being kept in cages their entire lives as live burglar alarm systems which is why for a long time native dogs have been stuck with the common name bantai or literally guard the concept of dogs to be taken for shots or vet care was virtually non-existent up to now the majority of those who troop to veterinary clinics in our country are those with purebred dogs. Baby shots were projects of local government units or city mayors. They were expected to be free services. They are it. Uh, spay neuter are also concepts totally alien to Pinoy's, especially in the late 1990s. There were such rare procedures that veterinary schools did not train vets to spay neuter correctly. Paws had a difficult time in the late 90s to look for vets who could do spay surgery in an aseptic way. It was not until 2004 onwards that trainings from animal welfare groups in Western countries had begun to bear fruit. Also, with the advent of the Animal Welfare Act in 1998, the Philippines' first anti-cruelty law lobbied for by PAWS, awareness of animal welfare concepts slowly trickled in. So we go back to the category of companion animals in the stray and semi-stray category because this is important in our discussion of advocating for strays. For the stray category, the challenge is to push for animal control facilities to be compliant with animal welfare standards. To help compliance, groups should push for guidelines for animal control facilities under whatever laws that they have in their country. In our case, it was under the Animal Welfare Act. We helped draft the Administrative Circular Number 3, and by coming up with these guidelines, this was a stronger push for city pounds to follow minimum welfare standards. When dealing with pound or animal control, there's usually a choice between collaboration or prosecution. Um, animal facility collaborations are preferred or otherwise a group must be prepared to fight in court. We have to emphasize that pounds must run a humane facility. There is a push for no-kill pounds here in the Philippines, but this is simply not possible if we still don't have massive spay neuter programs and regulation of pet selling. Proper euthanasia must be done for the hundreds of dogs collected and not adopted as pounds struggle with their mandate to keep streets safe from congregating packs of stray dogs who are already emboldened by the increasing number of feeders. And in terms of collaboration, um, Mandaluyong Animal Shelter Volunteers or Mass Volunteers came to pause for advice and training. And so there were seminars on handling animals humanely, spaying, neutering, having admission policies, quarantine, and putting up animals for adoption. The volunteers have also been trained to push for admitted sick animals that needed to be euthanized right away in these pounds which have no quarantine cages so as not to compromise the welfare of those who are healthy and adoptable. Now go to the second category of animals who are abandoned and unwanted by owners. The approach of the animal welfare advocate should be to rehome and adopt in a limited capacity only. We have to think of the bigger picture having SN programs proper trap, neuter, and return programs campaign actively against the selling and the buying of pets because, quite simply put, there are not enough homes for them all. There will always be more dogs in need of homes than those who are able to provide them. So let us not delude ourselves into thinking that adoption will be the solution to the problem. Numerous new animal welfare groups have started out with good intentions but are unable to follow animal welfare laws themselves. Uh, let's take a look at this list of registered shelters under the Bayi. And only four shelters are recorded in the entire Philippines, including the Philippine Animal Welfare Society or PAWS, despite the fact that there are more than 50 small-scale shelters already operating, as can be seen on Facebook. So many of these shelters have been reported for having poor standards of care with this temper outbreak, overcrowding, unspayed or unneutered animals being adopted out, so these small groups are trapped in an endless cycle of rescuing dogs from government-run animal pounds. We must realize that education and empowerment, and sometimes it's a bit of pushing back like filing cases, is the key to making animal welfare work and animal control facilities to shape up and comply with animal welfare laws. 
If we cannot shelter all strays, where does that leave us in solutions for semi-stray? The answer is proper PNR. For cats, we must make sure that we are not creating systems that make stray cats congregate in public spaces. We have to make sure that they are kept out of sight by properly timed feeding. Doing TNR in a scientific manner such as first conducting a census of cats prior to starting the TNR so that we can show the public that the numbers are going down. Educating stakeholders and making communities sign memorandums of agreement about no taming of the cats, managed feeding, and keeping the cats out of sight for most part of the day is also a strategy that will protect the cat. Community cat interventions does not mean treating them as outdoor pets. We receive more reports of cats being run over in parking lots where they are fed, being kicked away by surprised pedestrians, resulting in fatal diaphragmatic hernia in cats and kittens, or worse, property managers resorting to calling pest control companies as they have begun to see their outdoor areas being converted into cat parks complete with litter boxes, etc. We always choose to promote stray welfare by looking at how they can continue to stay away from the general public and how they can be trapped and their reproduction top. Cat parks can only be for selected special communities with either advocates being employees of the said school or mall but for a great number of public places, community cat interventions means not treating them as outdoor pets in order to keep them safe and out of sight. Third category of animals are owned but not controlled. As much as possible, animal welfare advocates must not encourage these systems of keeping animals. Calls for pounds not to impound animals is also not solving the problem. It's not sending the right message to irresponsible pet owners condemning pounds for euthanasia before we even find a way to increase pain neuter programs is a mistake. Now, there is a city that boasts of a no-stray capture system by which they just follow the stray dogs home and say that they are able to trace them to their irresponsible pet owners. To avoid fines and prosecution, these same owners or animal keepers can simply say that they were just feeding these dogs and the dogs are really not theirs. We know this because we have had unsuccessful prosecutions of pet abandoners. Until we have a fail-proof pet registration system, attempting to punish humans instead of punishing dogs will continue to be a dream. An interesting study of the biting dogs were owned dogs. These are dogs allowed to roam. Allowing dogs to roam in a limited number may not be a problem in some areas, but generally dismantling animal control systems or dismantling the pound system by itself is going to result in a myriad of human-animal conflicts, traffic accidents, unsanitary streets littered with poop, packs of dogs chasing after pedestrians, an outbreak of distemper in residential areas among others. A pound will always be needed when there are stray dogs. But as we say, the root of the problem starts with pet owners. There will be no strays if there are no irresponsible owners. NGOs must focus on providing low-cost pay neuter over stray feeding. We must continue to lobby for our local governments to offer spay neuter programs on top of just rabies vaccination programs. Before I end my presentation on uh, how we can end the culture or practice of having outdoor pets. Here are the faces of stray animals that pause, two stray animals that pause as rescued, and the cruelties that they have had to endure for being treated as outdoor pets. Dolores was a victim of boiling oil thrown at her. Um, she was perhaps looking for a meal, so she got a little too close to perhaps someone who was cooking, and this resulted in half of her face being burned off. After a year of being rehabilitated physically, emotionally, she was rehomed last November. Now, Jack Skellington, who was a long-time stray, was found and he was tied to a post, and he ended up being a bag of bones when the pandemic started and there was a lockdown in Metro Manila. He was literally skin and bones. And that's why we named him after character in The Nightmare Before Christmas, Jack Skellington. But it turns out he only needed a few weeks to fill out and was eventually rehabilitated and adopted out as well. In summary, 
we have to take apart the gargantuan problem of pet homelessness facing us. We have to identify the sources of strays and the reason why companion animals end up on the street and make sure that we as advocates do not contribute to the narrative that will tell people that the status quo is okay because it is not. Advocating for strays means showing irresponsible pet owners the euthanasia figures not hiding the euthanasia, condemning euthanasia, or even the lack of euthanasia in town. We have to get enough people angry about this so that they would care more about preventive life-saving measures such as spay and neuter. So advocating for strays is not saving them from death or starvation. Advocating for strays is making sure we come up with systems that enable them to live with the rest of the population without being a nuisance to the public and without endangering public health. Advocating for strays means making sure we end pet homelessness through a strategy that strikes at the very core, at the very source of the problem. Because we owe it to Dolores and we owe it to Jack and to the thousands of dogs like them. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, Right away, want to ask the audience if you have any questions, big or small, please do feel free to uh, write them up in our little Q&A box. We'll be happy to answer them after our panel is over. Uh, going on next, we'll I'll now be humbly introducing Dr. Catherine Pollock, uh, who is a veterinarian dedicated to improving animal welfare in Southeast Asia. She graduated from Iowa State University's College of veterinary medicine, followed by an internship in the shelter medicine and surgery at Colorado State University, and later a residency in shelter medicine at the University of Florida. Dr. Paula currently serves as head of stray animal care, uh, Southeast Asia for Four Paws International, a global animal welfare organization based in Vienna, Austria. Dr. Paula lives in Thailand and manages the companion animal programs in Thailand, Cambodia, Indonesia, and Vietnam with a special focus on combating the cruel dog and cat meat trade in the region. I pass the floor to Catherine, who will speak on transforming challenges into opportunities, improving companion and welfare in Southeast Asia. Over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Catherine Pollock, and thank you for joining this talk. The title of the presentation is Transforming Challenges into Opportunities, Improving Companion Animal Welfare in Southeast Asia. I currently serve as the Head of Stray Animal Care Southeast Asia for Four Paws International, which is a global animal welfare charity with offices in 15 countries, and we do a variety of wildlife and companion animal work here in Asia. So to get started, I think it goes without saying that in the year 2020, the world in which we knew it ended in many ways. It was suddenly a new environment with new challenges involving both people and animals. And in many ways, the world became a much more difficult one to work in. But there were also some real opportunities that presented for helping animals and bettering our programs. What's important to note is a lot of the companion animal issues you know, that became perhaps more immediate to address during the pandemic were already well in existence <laughs> prior to, to COVID-19. And these aren't gonna come as a surprise to anyone that's working in the region. We continue to see limited veterinary capacity in many communities in which we work. Um, many veterinarians don't receive adequate training in small animal medicine and surgery, and they graduate you know, simply without these skills uh, and then you know, we wonder why, you know, pet owners are reluctant perhaps to get their animals spayed neutered or why the government isn't doing more for, you know, the management of stray cats and dogs. Um, in many communities as well throughout Southeast Asia, there continues to be an overpopulation of stray animals. Uh, if you come to Thailand, for instance, and you go to a 7-Eleven, you will be greeted uh, with many of these community owned dogs that like to enjoy the air con at the 7-Eleven. Um, we also see the incidence of rabies despite multiple pledges for the region to go rabies free. So uh, a lack of investment in, in canine rabies vaccination programs in many countries. We continue to see hoarding, which is an international phenomenon, but one that very much has been exacerbated, uh, I think, because of the COVID-19 situation, because uh, 
the, the people that are kind of hoarding these animals have lost their funding sources. So it's become more obvious, I think, of these, you know, horrendous animal welfare situations. Very specific to Southeast Asia is the dumping of unwanted animals at Buddhist temples or pagodas. And so we often see high levels of animal suffering at these places. Uh, and then of course, overcrowded shelters. This was nothing new, but very much was exacerbated by the COVID-19 situation. And for those of you that travel frequently in Southeast Asia, you'll recognize this is Suwannabumi Airport here in Bangkok. And this airport continues to be shuttered uh, due to the international travel ban, which is ongoing. Um, and so this has had devastating effects on, I mean, not only people, but on companion animals, both strays and pets alike. Because tourist industry, tourism industries were devastated, you know, strays lost their food sources suddenly, uh, pet owners lost their jobs. There was an increased abandonment of animals on the streets or in temples or at shelters that quickly became even more overcrowded. Uh, many of them now operating with even limited personnel resources. Um, you know, many people that many shelters that relied also on foreign volunteers to serve as, you know, foster homes or perhaps, uh, you know, just volunteered as animal care staff, you know, they had to go back to their country. So you have the situation where shelters that were already, you know, operating, um, you know, very almost at maximum capacity or sometimes even exceeding that now had a drastic decrease in their workforce and uh, more animals that they were being forced to take care of. We also saw when we went out and did these feeding programs that there were outbreaks of disease among these dogs. And it's not clear to me whether or not that's because of um, a cessation or a halt in the programmatic outreach work in many of these communities that animals weren't being vaccinated or perhaps more puppies were being born or there was more of a stressful situation among the animals with limited resources. But we started to see these really devastating outbreaks of distemper and parvovirus um, among free roaming dogs. Um, of course, for shelters that you know, utilize international adoption, so sending dogs and cats to North America or to Europe, you know, that suddenly came, that started suddenly ground to a halt because of the lack of, of um, you know, flights and routes that were available. And so for those organizations, there was a sudden, you know, overcrowding at their facility because that mechanism for live release suddenly went away. And we also saw medical supply chains disrupted as well, when, uh, you know, particularly with anesthetic drugs to, to continue doing the work for, you know, spay, neuter, et cetera. And it felt like all of our well-laid plans, you know, for the year and years uh, even beyond that really went out the window and there was an urgent need to simply keep animals alive. And so here's a photo from Bali, uh, from our friends at Bali Animal Welfare Association, which quickly deployed multiple teams across the island to deliver food to dogs that had lost their food sources from hotels being closed, restaurants being closed, um, poor you know, community members who suddenly couldn't feed their animals anymore. Um, and so this really required a lot of agility and flexibility also to, to really be able to pivot uh, program activities um, and to you know, reach these animals in need. But of course, you know, with every challenge comes opportunity. So we can always view this in two different ways. Um, even though that we had to really shift uh, you know, program object objectives and activities, it also gave us a bit of a pause to figure out you know, are there better ways of doing things? What are the communities that are in most need? You know, these feeding programs are not necessarily something that we would um, pursue during normal situation because we, we don't want to necessarily increase resources in the community for these dogs, but rather, you know, we want them to be spay neutered, to be healthy. And we want to empower community members to be able to take care of and manage these animals. However, these feeding programs did allow us to identify animals in need, identify pockets in the community where animals weren't being sterilized and to also really engage with uh, you know, community leaders and pet owners during that time. So with these challenges came opportunity to figure out how can we make our programs even more successful, particularly when things go back to normal-ish uh, and when you know, activities can resume. Um, 
I think one of the major take home points from the pandemic is that you know, local problems require local solutions. And in many ways, we've, I mean, we've always known that, um, but we've never, we haven't necessarily always put that into place, right? Um, we simply can't rely on these fly in, fly out type programs where foreign beds drop in for a clinic, they spay and neuter some animals, but that doesn't actually address the issue, but, you know, which often stems from human behavior, lack of responsible pet ownership, veterinary training, all of these things. Um, and so what the pandemic really emphasized to us at Four Paws as an international charity is the continued need to capacity build local charity groups that we work with, the local veterinary communities, local government, to make sure that they can continue to be effective, understand the issues and have well-trained staff and communities that are constantly being engaged with you know, to ultimately have a greater impact for the animals that we want to serve. And of course, this really also emphasized the need for building that local adoption culture, because, I mean, as we know, international adoption should not really be thought of as a long term strategy for rehoming cats and dogs. I mean, of course, there are some exceptions to this where these adoptions further campaign strategies or whatnot. But generally speaking, there's never been a better time than now to invest in campaigns, and it, it won't necessarily be cheap, but to really start promoting pet adoption as the first option for obtaining pets. Uh, and maybe it's time to engage with pet food companies or the pet industry to really create a revolution where, you know, in, in countries where going to a shelter is still very foreign, you know, to obtain an animal, uh, that we start looking at investing in that. Um, because right now there aren't other options for you know, finding these animals homes. And again, many charities are already very successful at this, but I do think that there is still, and particularly even on a national level in some countries, um, a real opportunity to start furthering momentum on building an adoption culture. Uh, the pandemic also allowed us, and I think across all sectors, not just animal welfare, but to really realize and start um, utilizing the digital space more effectively. In Indonesia specifically, um, Jakarta Animal Aid Network has done an amazing job at that. And they've actually launched during the pandemic the first ever online animal welfare platform. Um, and they've hosted webinars for you know, the sheltering community to try to address some of these disease issues that we had been seeing, um, not only with stray animals, but also in the shelters. Um, and even as uh, recent as last week, uh, a national workshop was held, particularly for, for government members, but on the dog meat trade. And who would have ever thought like there would be such great attendance and interest from the government to join, you know, an online workshop. And it just really highlights, you know, on the dog meat trade itself. And so it really just emphasizes that this digital space exists and there's just so much opportunity to take advantage of it to reach so many more people. Um, and I'm sure that this trend will continue beyond the pandemic uh, to better you know, disseminate resources and reach more people. And you know, it really goes without saying, and for all of the reasons I've already mentioned in this presentation, but we must invest in local veterinary training. Um, that you know, particularly with these international travel bans, in many ways, it's again just proving what we've already known to be true: that we need competent in-country teams and programs and veterinarians that you know are able to to take on the challenges in their own communities and do the work. And so, I know it's it's a bit easier said than done because this really should be addressed more at an academic, you know, a university level to make sure that that training is sufficient. Um, but it is also our obligation as NGOs to train up and to make sure that surgery is being done at the highest standard possible. So whenever possible to incorporate veterinary training, this is a photo from our team that works with Paws for Compassion in central Vietnam. So we always try to make sure that we are training the, the Vietnamese veterinary community in high volume, um, high quality surgical techniques. And I know that there is already a separate session completely dedicated to this topic. So I'm not going to talk too much about it here, but what I will say is that the pandemic has really allowed us to highlight uh, the public health dangers that live animal trades you know, can pose to public health um, and the risk for future pandemics 
but particularly um, specific to the dog and cat meat trade. And last summer at the height of the pandemic, uh, the Siem Reap provincial government in Cambodia declared the first ever ban on the dog meat trade. And it wasn't just talk either. Um, they've actually been taking action. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, they actually just confiscated a minibus that was packed full with 61 dogs, as the photo here on the screen, um, and, and called us for assistance in, in taking care of them. So there is a lot of exciting progress happening that I think actually was uh, motivated a bit by the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's really exciting and, you know, stay tuned as we see, hopefully see more regional momentum, um, you know, in the months to come. I appreciate that this was a very short and sweet presentation. I look forward to taking any questions that you might have and also hearing about your experience in the region pertaining to companion animal management and companion animal welfare. Um, my email is katherine.pollock at fourpaws.org and you can also get in touch with me there. So thank you. Thank you so much. We're now uh, at our Q&A. So I would request everyone to unmute themselves. Also to the audience, if you have any, any questions, big or small, please feel free to comment. We'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, we've got a question. Um, this would be directed firstly to Anna. Uh, are, are there any laws in the Philippines that give guidelines in setting up a dog shelter? Um, yes, under the, animal, under the Animal Welfare Act, there is um, AO number five. Uh, we developed this AO only fairly recently, I think three years ago, um, because uh, we've been seeing also a lot of shelters not being guided. And this was released at about the same time that the pound guidelines were also released. released. So the AC number three is the guidelines for the pounds, which we developed under the Committee on Animal Welfare. And then next to that was the guidelines on shelters. So yes, there are now guidelines. Great. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, would you say, uh, what about other countries by any chance across uh, Asia? Yeah, I mean, in most of the countries that I work in, we don't see such specific legislation. I think this is where the Philippines shines, I mean, probably largely due to the work of, of Anna and her team, um, where we don't see similar legislation. In Thailand, there is an animal welfare law um, so that can be applied in various situations where we know that there's cruelty occurring, but as it pertains to shelters, generally speaking, uh, countries have very few guidelines or, you know, regulations for which they, you know, have accountability uh, for, you know, animal practices in that facility. All right. Um, Catherine was wondering another question um, is, what do you feel are the biggest challenges coming in the next couple of months for companion animals? Well, I'm not sure that there's, you know, very specific or, or different challenges because the challenges are, are kind of consistent, right? Um, you know, the challenges I can say, you know, that are very current are, are many of those that I covered in the talk and those pertain largely to international travel bans. Um, you know, these shelter facilities are really challenged. I mean, during normal times, operating an, an animal welfare NGO was difficult, but now it's just become even harder because of lack of funding sources, lack of donations, particularly internationally, um, you know, lack of volunteers. Some organizations relied on, you know, foreigners to bring or travelers to bring, you know, medical supplies or equipment. Um, and, and Cambodia is a good example right now where we have severe lockdowns. All of Phnom Penh is locked down. So the teams can't even go out uh, to conduct you know, feeding or, or rescue operations. So, so I think these challenges, it, it, it's hard because we get lulled into a sense of things are getting better, you know, particularly from the COVID situation. It's getting, but then um, we see these, these spikes and lockdowns and it really challenges the ability to do basic work. Great, thank you. Anna, and your thoughts on this? I agree fully with Catherine and her acknowledgement of the digital platforms that it's going to play a big role because we have been informed that the pandemic is not going away anytime soon. And our back to normal might still be um, wearing masks, not being able to visit places. So digital platform is the way to go. And I think we've recognized this early on at pause. Most of our calls for adoption 
is on Facebook, uh, very popular in the Philippines, and it's free. Um, the, the good news is most of these platforms are free, even for the smallest NGOs. And we've taken to encouraging the pounds as well to use uh, Facebook as a way that they can um, market uh, the adoptable dog or an adoptable cat. And um, it, it really is uh, a way for us to survive because right now with the extreme lockdown in Metro Manila, um, we, we have had to close our shelter, our physical one, and there are no visitors coming in. It's like there's no adoption inquiries because we used to have walk-ins for those. So we've shifted. We've put our adoption um, processes in on Zoom. We're now on Zoom. We're doing ocular inspections of houses on Zoom. And um, we've really had to adjust. And we've had to adjust quickly because if we did not, there are a lot of for-profit businesses that have closed down in the Philippines alone. So if it is difficult for the businesses, then all the more it is for the nonprofits. So we have to be on our toes and use digital platform to our advantage. Great, thank you. Um, Anna, uh, another question is, um, was wondering uh, what do you feel since you've got a lot of experience and you've also really been in the front lines, um, what are your thoughts on the difference between Asian and Western interpretations of companion animals? Like, do you feel like there's a big difference in Asia comparison to the West? I think Asian countries have been deeply influenced by what they see in Western countries. Uh, like, for example, our concept of dogs before, when we would um, we would get these advertisements for dog food and they would only feature um, Dalmatians, golden retrievers, and all these purebred dogs. We never had, when as I was growing up, we never had a dog food um, advertisement that had our native dogs. And this perhaps contributed to the notion that our native dogs were inferior to the purebred ones and we see native dogs in varying states of, of neglect. And they have become second-class citizens in our own country. And it's because we have been exposed first to the, like, the Western uh, type of dog. And in the Philippines, colonial mentality is very strong. Um, we have, we get, you know, the usual, our dolls, our, our Caucasian dolls, we don't have dolls that are, so I think that has also transmitted down to our, our companion animals. And we're trying to change this so hard at cost that our um, native dogs are companion animals and that you don't have to buy one, the, this, this, the toy poodles and stuff just to be, to have a companion animal because they were treating our native dogs as they, they can fend for themselves out in the streets. That's why they were called Askals, Asunkali or street dogs. Well, we have a different breed of dog, which we can buy from the pet shops. And this really, we're trying to um, really eradicate this type of thinking. And uh, we want companion animals to be on the same level, regardless of breed. Thank you. Catherine, same, likewise. Um, you have a lot of experience, especially across Asia and want to ask you the same question. So what are your thoughts on the difference between um, Asian and Western interpretations of companion animals? And is there any, do you feel there is a big difference? Yeah, I think it's starting yeah. to, the, the difference between the two is actually starting to narrow very much, kind of like similar to what, to what Anna said in some ways. I think one of the key differences that I see is this and this is this is variable. So this, uh, you know, it, it's hard to kind of generalize. If Southeast Asia is like this, or Asia is like this, right? Because there's such peculiarities, and uh, every and every city is different, every country is different. But we do see kind of more of this accepted notion of community-owned dogs, uh, whereas you know in Europe you you wouldn't see that so much um, in places in Western Europe or in North America where, you know, you'll, I mean, Thailand, again, is, I'll use that as an example, where if you see, you know, five dogs on a street, on a corner, and you point to one dog, and you ask all the members in the, that community, and no one will claim ownership of that dog, right? Like, many people feed it, though, like, they all feed it. 
but nobody says, yeah, that's my dog. But you might have like a, a purebred, like a cute white purebred poodle, poodly dog. And that is sure, you know, surely someone will say that's my dog, right? So there is definitely kind of this um, discrepancy between a community owned dogs versus pet dogs. I do think that a worrying trend that we are seeing, and, and this is throughout the world, not just specific to Asia, is this, uh, you know, real desire to have these purebred dogs, particularly in climates where these dogs aren't, you know, appropriate because it's big business. It is big. It's very lucrative for traders. Um, and I do worry about this trend of, um, again, this trend where we see, again, it's only heightening this separation between kind of native, you know, soy dogs, as we call them in Thailand, which is just your general, you know, street, usually brown, black looking, medium sized dog. There's a very, you know, dis distinct distinction between that dog and, and a pet dog. Um, and that is being certainly propagated through marketing and through advertisement. So it, it's, a, it's a bit concerning for sure. Thank you. Um, another question, Catherine, um, is about corporates. Like the fact that you're, you know, working with, you know, companion animals and so on. Do, has there been a big influence of corporations or have you dealt with corporations in your field? Sure. I mean, we, we try to engage corporates uh, in, in a variety of ways. Um, often corporates have CSR policies, so they have corporate social responsibility you know, policies where hotels, for instance, might be willing to invest in a TNR program for cats, let's say, or another community engagement project in the areas where they have their businesses. I think where there's also real opportunity for corporate engagement certainly is in the pet sector, right? Um, and I always say this about the dog and cat meat trade specifically. It's, it's not a sexy topic. It's something that corporates don't want their name associated with. But if you think about who would benefit from eradicating the dog and cat meat trade, it's the pet food companies. You know, there would be far more dogs and far more pet owners um, potentially. And so we do work with a variety of, um, you know, I'd say us as, as four paws, with a variety of, of corporates uh, in the pet industry on a variety of topics um, pertaining to companion animal welfare. Great, thank you. Anna, same question for you. Um, the role of corporates and, and how have you felt? I mean, have you seen is it a very large presence or has there been a lot of complications or so on? Um, definitely uh, same with Catherine, the CSR program. Uh, they would come to our shelter and do like the painting or the building of a certain area, all fully funded by the, the corporate. Um, an interesting trend now is that the corporates have more and more um, Zoom meetings and they have begun asking us to have uh, guest shelter animals um, to make an appearance during their Zoom meetings. I think people are bored to death. They're like many, one Zoom after the other and they want to see an animal. And they said, we're willing to pay, um, just have your shelter animal present at our meeting. And we have in fact um, agreed to some of these requests. So there. Um, Anna, a question that comes to mind is especially about the fact that you've seen this big difference in, in what COVID has done, especially, and pre-COVID. And now with the vaccine rollout that's happening, uh, do you feel like things, that things are going to be more positive now? Or do you feel like this is going to be a continuing situation, uh, um, especially for companion animals? Oh, companion, yes. Um, well, just as to go off tangent a bit, we have, um, during the pandemic, we have heard of disturbing news that macaques in the Philippines are being rounded up so that they can be tested on for the COVID-19 vaccine. So that was one of the, the negative side of, of the pandemic. And um, AFA has helped us, the coalition has helped us there for companion animals, I think the challenge now is convincing people that dogs and cats of those who died from COVID-19 do not carry um, COVID-19. They are not going to pass it on to uh, the ones who are going to adopt them. Um, we have sent out an alert to the AFA coalition that two weeks ago when Metro Manila was put on a lockdown, there was uh, the spike in the number of deaths in COVID in Metro Manila. And the result was what were people, they were calling us up and they were emailing us that they didn't want to take over the dog or cat of the deceased 
the one who died from COVID-19, fearing that the dog or cat would bring COVID to them. So uh, we put out uh, materials that explain that dogs and cats cannot give COVID to you. And so there must be a constant assurance of this as the world changes and tries to cope with the COVID situation. I think this is important um, because this is the first time that this is happening worldwide and people are not very good at adjusting immediately. And sometimes they look for a thing to blame it on and usually it's the animals and we have to be on our toes and always try to correct or, or try to um, speak for the animals so that they don't end up as you know, victims of, of people trying to also cope with something, all the new changes. Great, thank you. Catherine, the same question for you. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I have a lot of specific information to add more than what Anna mentioned. I think that the vaccine rollout in Southeast Asia, and again, it's hard to generalize an entire region, but has been uh, left um, a bit to be desired, should I say. And so it does seem to be quite slow. And, and you know, it's very well published that there's some severe vaccine inequalities uh, that are happening. And so it, it's a shame because, you know, we've really been trying to push for all of our local teams uh, to get their vaccines being frontline workers. And certainly I know the teams at, at Bawa and Bali just got their vaccines. Um, so that it is happening in some places where in others it's, it's not yet. And so, you know, we're just keeping our fingers crossed that, uh, you know, it, the situation continues to improve. Um, I have another question for you, Catherine, is in regards to basically what do, would you say is a strategy for shelters to do when irresponsible owners want to surrender their animals? What would be a method of responsible annual animal companionship? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the trend that a lot of you know, shelters are really going towards is more viewing the community as a shelter in and of itself. And we've seen this very much with the pandemic in, in the United States, places in Europe as well, where there is more responsibility being placed on the owner themselves and shelters being looked to more as places to provide resources to try to keep animals in homes uh, rather than in the shelter. So I think, you know, first and foremost, you know, the, the role would be to try to you know, work with this specific person who's trying to, you know, relinquish their animal and see if there's any middle ground or any opportunity for, you know, offering support. Uh, maybe this person can't provide food for their animal anymore, or maybe they can't find pet friendly housing and they have to move. And so maybe there's opportunities there for, you know, a shelter to help. And another way that shelters is, is handling the situation in some, in some respect is they're also doing a surrender by appointment. So, um, you know, if you're going to surrender an animal, please make an appointment and let us talk to you first, you know, to really engage more in a conversation rather than an open door policy where animals are just, you know, kind of left at the doorstep, so to speak. Great. Thank you. Um, Anna, your thoughts on this? The same question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I fully agree also with Catherine that um, there has to be other programs that would keep people from relinquishing their pets. Um, at PAWS, at our shelter, we do not allow pet relinquishments. We provide many options, like we talk to the owner um, for landlord problems. We also say rehoming assistance. So we put out the, the photo of your pet if your pet is spayed or neutered, or um, if, if there's a medical problem, we provide medical assistance um, at our clinic, but we never accept the animal into the shelter because of pet relinquishment. We we just say that um, the animal the animal shelter is exclusively for victims of cruelty or neglect. And if you in the Philippines, if you allow people to abandon their pets and still have that law where pet abandonment is a crime and no one is prosecuting it, you're going to have a situation where people will say, you know, I'll just take a pet when it's nice and good and healthy, and I'll go to a shelter to relinquish this pet when it's no longer working out for me. And that's a bad message to send. A pet is a lifetime commitment. So shelters should not enable pet relinquishments at all. We have to um, be proactively assisting those who would want to uh, uh, abandon their pets and then educate them. And then also go uh, very strongly for prosecution uh, against those who are abandoning 
these animals because um, in the Philippines, we have a section in our law that says abandonment is a crime. But a small trivia, we've never had a successful prosecution for pet abandonments uh, simply because it was so hard to trace a pet directly to an owner. There's no microchipping system in place yet, but we're hoping that in the future, this would be addressed. Thank you. Um, another question um, that's come is in regards to euthanasia and is it, can it be described as a necessary, necessary evil in the short term for the promotion of adoption in the long term? Is that my question yes, for me? Yes. All right. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> okay. Now, euthanasia is not a um, solution. It is a consequence of uh, irresponsible pet ownership. So sometimes we are confused as to whether we are addressing a symptom of the problem or the source of a problem. So we think, why is there euthanasia? Because there are so many animals in the street. And so there are people who like no kill, no kill, or, or that they go and, and try to save animals from the pound, but they don't go into spay neuter programs. They don't um, spay neuter the animals that they adopt out. So you're just running around in circles. So we keep saying, if you wanna solve a problem, think of what is the source first. So if you're trying to stop a flooding in, in your bathroom, your, your, in the Philippines, we have tabo or the, it's, it's a water dipper where, where you, so you can decrease the level of the water using the, your water dipper. But if you don't turn off the faucet, this problem will keep on recurring. So the focus should be on long-term solutions. So yes, there might be euthanasia that happens in pounds. Um, we, we cannot uh, avoid that at the onset. But if you have your spay neuter programs running, eventually the number of those that are euthanized are going to also go down because um, you can't have like no unregulated pet breeding, no spay neuter programs in a national level, and then say no euthanasia in pounds. It simply is not realistic. So there will be euthanasia and then you work on uh, preventive solutions, long-term solutions. And in the end, you will be affecting change towards the euthanasia levels. So that is our take on this problem. Great, thank you. Catherine, this is the same question, last one for you in regards to euthanasia. Sure, I mean, this is a tough one. And I'll say in a lot of the communities that I work in specifically, euthanasia is not really in the toolkit of options uh, for the management of animals due to the Buddhist culture and the, you know, kind of the, the religious and cultural feelings and ramifications of euthanasia. And so that creates an entire other, you know, situation where when you don't have that in a toolkit and not that that should ever be you know, looked at as a solution again, because the, the solution is addressing the underlying reasons of why we have shelter overcrowding, overpopulation, overpopulations of, of stray animals. Um, and that's often human behavior, right? Um, and so, so many, many shelters will use euthanasia as a mechanism, but I can speak to the communities that I work in that is not, you know, something that would be culturally palatable. Um, and so that creates challenges where, again, it's even more important to have animals not coming into the, into the shelter in the first place, because what you end up with is these shelters that have thousands of animals in really horrific conditions. And so that is, you know, equally as unacceptable. Great, thank you. So we've reached the end of our session. Uh, just wanted to first of all say thank you, Anna, Catherine. It's been amazing having both of you. Um, really, I, I think also for the audience, it's been a, I hope it's been a great experience. Thank you so much for uh, the interaction and I wish you all the very, very best. Uh, stay safe, stay happy, stay good and best of luck. Thank you so much. <laughs>